Greetings. This is Paul the Poke from paulthepoke.com. Um, some of you may also know me as Paul Lear from valortube.com, original content provider. Uh, we're going to consolidate posts, uh, videos this evening. Got a lot of things going on with uh, Russia and Ukraine. Uh, pretty much taking a lot of oxygen out of the room with the headlines. I want to also take some time here to focus on uh, some things that are happening kind of quietly. And there seems to be uh, a build, if you will. The drum the drum beats getting a little bit louder um, on this topic. And it's, it's kind of behind the scenes what Russia is saying to Israel and what uh, kind of cues is or Russia is giving towards the Middle East. Um, and this is something that started to happen, oh, I'd say earlier in the week. We've got a series of articles that I found, and ultimately we're going to end up in a discussion I had last evening with Checkmate regarding this topic. And it seems to be gaining a little bit of momentum. And I think it's important that we understand that it is happening because ultimately, you know, from a prophetic standpoint, um, my interest in this is from the standpoint of Ezekiel 38 and 39. And that is a prophecy that Ezekiel had written roughly 2,600 years ago. And the cliff notes of that is, is that Russia, ancient Magog will be led by a leader named Gog and he will have with him Turkey. And that'd be Meshach, Tubal, Beth the Garma, Gomer, along with Persia, modern day Iran, put ancient put modern day Libya and uh, Ethiopia, modern day Sudan, well, some other countries. And I suspect those will be some of the old former Soviet blocs that will be joining Russia, along with some of the countries in the Balkans, possibly Georgia, Azerbaijan. We'll see. We'll see. But at any rate, those folks are going to uh, Russia, led by Russia, will invade uh, Israel from the north on the Golan Heights. And you can follow my cursor. We'll, we'll zoom in here. See the little red circle? That's pretty much right where it's happening. That's where it says they will come through. Also likely get down into what is modern-day Jordan, southern Syria, and approach Israel a little bit from the east as well through the Golan Heights, uh, Sea of Galilee. This would be uh, the Dead Sea right here. But but mostly through this area. And that's that's the interest of this. Now, clearly... You know, there is a military build that's taking place in Syria uh, with a lot of Russian troops. They do have some troops down there on the Golan Heights currently, but it's not the type of buildup that's discussed in Scripture. And, and what has been fascinating to watch is the military build that is taking place uh, in and around Ukraine. Russia has literally put 50 to 60 percent of its military resources <clears throat> on the border of Ukraine and in the Black Sea on the south, surrounding pretty much Ukraine, with the exception of this little strip of land right here between Poland and the Ukraine, Slovakia, Hungary, Romania. Otherwise, uh, they have Ukraine surrounded. 130,000 troops, upwards of maybe 150,000 troops. Uh, a lot of naval assets in the Black Sea, Mediterranean Sea. And eventually, you know, are we are we seeing things being set up to where they drop those things south off the Crimean Peninsula in through the Black Sea, bring a lot of arms, naval capability into the eastern Mediterranean, and then bring... Uh, army military hardware around the black sea down into the middle east that's where it's headed scripture says that's going to happen uh points not to break down 38 39 it doesn't go well for them i mean god hands them their ass and then some so that's how that ends but we're not there yet um i think i can make a pretty good case that that's going to take place toward the back half of the seven-year tribulation. There are some geographical hints there, but that's a discussion for another day. But just so just so you get a flavor of the idea, um, 
they're already peaking to the south, that being Russia. <clears throat> here's a here's a story out of the AP. Belarus to send 200 troops to Syria alongside Russians. And the funny thing about this, this was put out on the 7th, so this would have been Monday. And I I literally had been discussing this issue with with Checkmate. And I said, you know, I said just speculating out loud, my thought is is that you know, whatever goes down in in the Ukraine, Russia's probably going to get their way, going to feel empowered, feel emboldened, and then they're want to want to go south. But before they get to Israel, I thought they'd make a stop in what is modern day Syria and Damascus and clean that situation up under the guise of quote peace and security. Well, and they may still use peace and security, I don't know. But <laughs> they did use this term. And this is out of Moscow. Belarus plans to deploy 200 troops to Syria to serve alongside Russian forces in the country. Uh, A draft agreement between Russia and its ally, Belarus, endorsed by Russian Prime Minister Mikhail Mishutsin, says the Belarusian troops will provide, quote, humanitarian assistance. So that's, I mean, they, they start dropping this terminology and you need to pay attention to it now because here we are in early February. And uh, that's one of the things uh, I've learned quite a bit from Checkmate about is these folks are great at messaging and they know how to send out a coordinated message and they're good at it. Uh, so when you start seeing little buzzwords like, quote, humanitarian assistance, you can bet if they're serious about it, you're going to start hearing it in other other uh, sources of media, whether it be social media, traditional media, newsprint, internet, TV. I mean, they've got resources. Russia does. I mean, they have their they have their newspapers, they have their websites, they have their TV outlets. They're no different than us in the West. Now they're just better at messaging. Uh, that's one of the things I've learned from checkmate. It's like, when you start to see this coming out in a coordinated effort, you need to pay attention. And so I was just watching all this go down and I thought, well, you know, it stands to reason just looking at scripture, let's stop in Syria, straighten out all this quote, uh, terrorism. And then, then we'll deal with Israel. So that was on the seventh. So that'd been on Monday. And then this comes out of Haaretz, out of uh, Israel. Russia decries Israel's crude violations of Syria's sovereignty after airstrikes. And uh, Russia's foreign ministry spokeswoman says strikes attributed to Israel and Syria, where Russia's forces bolster President Assad, may trigger a sharp escalation of tensions and endanger passenger flights so now they're starting to talk about hey y'all need to cut this out you're going to start inter you know interfering with domestic flights <clears throat> and, and if you've been following this story well russia's been accused of using some radar jamming devices in and around ben gurion airport in israel affecting com- commercial uh t- you know private flights i, I don't know i guess uh, passenger flights as well um and this is from russia's foreign ministry maria zakrova was quoted by the russian news agency tass saying strikes may trigger a sharp escalation of tensions endangering international passenger flights russia systematically and resolutely opposes attempts to turn syria into a scene of armed confrontation between third countries Uh, uh, israel stop it is what she's saying once again we are insistently calling upon israeli side to refrain from such use of force and here's a picture this is russian foreign ministry spokeswoman maria zakharova I don't know if it's Zakrova or Zakharova. I've seen that A hop in there a couple of times. Sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. Anyway, this is a picture of the spokeswoman, Russian Foreign Ministry spokeswoman, Maria Z, uh, talking to TASS agency. Um, And it's also just in review, if you guys didn't catch this, Russia and Syria are now flying joint uh, 
flights down on the goal line to protect Syrian airspace. So they're doing that and it kind of as a signal, hey, Israel, cut it out. This is Russia and Syrian uh, flights on your border with Syria. And here, in fact, this article references that Syrian and Russian jets last month carried out their first joint patrol in the airspace along Syria's borders with Israel and uh, included the Golan Heights armistice line with Israel that has seen several regular airstrikes attributed to Israel against suspected Iranian and Hezbollah positions. Well, it isn't suspected. It is. You know, Iran keeps flying jumbo jets into Syria to drop off arms, and then those things are put on uh, different military vehicles, trucks, and so forth, and they try to haul that stuff into Lebanon. Well, that's what that's what Israel keeps doing. They keep blowing that stuff up. Just to give you a, a shot of it, I mean, so you can see where, uh, you know, we'll zero in on this. Whereas Hamadan, Hamadan's a major air base out of um, Iran. And so they'll fly stuff into Damascus, uh, and then they'll put it on trucks and try to take it into Lebanon. Well, most of these strikes take place from Israel right in this area along this road. And a lot of times Israel will strike from uh, international waters. <laughs> that way they can't be accused of violating anybody's airspace. And they use their uh, fighter jets to take these things out munition guided and down they go so so you have um you know foreign ministry russian foreign foreign ministry spokeswoman maria zakharova saying israel hey stop it okay you know by the way we're going to send some troops down in there as quote humanitarian assistance belarus is going to join russia and then we have this coming up uh, Russia strongly condemns Israeli aggression on Damascus vicinity. And this is Russian ambassador to Syria, Alexander Efimov. And he has condemned Israeli aggression on Damascus vicinity at dawn today. And this was what this would have been Wednesday, February 9th. Russia strongly condemns the Israeli air raids in Syria and calls to, in, to end them. And that's Efimov. And he spoke to Sputnik News, Sputnik Agency. Again, that's a Russian media source. Israeli attacks on Syrian lands are absolutely illegal according to the international law. Such attacks cause casualties and serious material damage, damages, and they violate the sovereignty of states, pose a threat to international civil air traffic. Again, talking about civ civilian air traffic and generally deteriorate the difficult military political situation in the region as a whole. So again, Israel butt out is pretty much the statement. So you got somebody, uh, you got the Russian ambassador to Syria making some comments. You know, military spokeswoman, hey, stop it. We're going to send troops down there for humanitarian purposes. Um, and then we had this happen. Um uh, I guess this came out, uh, this would have been Tuesday. This is a Lieutenant General Michael E. Carrilla. He's speaking before the Senate Armed Services Committee, and he's looking to be confirmed in the Biden administration. Told he would probably be confirmed. We'll get into who this guy. UN General tapped to take over as top U.S. commander in the Middle East warned senators Tuesday that if Russians invade Ukraine, the Russians, in, that if, well, there's a typo, look at that, I found a typo in Arab news, Russia invades Ukraine, uh, could create instability in the Middle East, including Syria. Now, he talks about Iran being the key threat to the U.S., and that may be so, but again, our focus here is taking a look at Russia and friends coming into the Middle East, ultimately into the Golan Heights to invade Israel, per Ezekiel's prophecy from 2,600 years ago. 
Uh, United States faces a new era of strategic competition with China and Russia that is not confined to one geographical region and extends into the area of responsibility. Um, and his concern is, is that, well, if Russia does that in Ukraine, all they got to do is come south and then they are, they're in the Middle East. Well, yeah. Um, There is a statement down here. Asked about the potential for repercussions in the Middle East of potential Russian invasion of Ukraine, Kirilla said he believes that it could spill over into Syria, where Russia already has a military base and troops. Now, for you, those of you who've been following um, our reports on this probably know already Russia has bases in Latakia and in Tartus in Syria, on the Mediterranean. There are two ports, two seaports. So, and gosh, brought, brought, brought troops into Syria, what was it, December, late September, somewhere last quarter of 2015. So they've been in there now a good six and a half years. <clears throat> and they have troops down here on the Golan as well. So does, so does Iran. I mean, the gang is all together. And then you do have Turkey here to the north. They're eventually... And how that all comes together, I got some ideas on that, but that's not the point of this. But, you know, so we have a, a U.S. general who can, you know, he can see the tea leaves. Hey, this is likely to happen. If Russia does invade Ukraine, they would not hesitate to be able to act as a spoiler in Syria as well. I mean, so he, he can see what their intentions are. And again, it has to do with the flow of oil and gas. Putin's made this statement public many times he wants to control the oil and gas flow to western europe and right now um you know the ukraine stands in the way uh he has gas deals with iran to use utilize some of their gas um the nord stream pipeline which is a gas line from russia into germany um he wants to control it. Putin has his fingers in Libya, Africa's largest oil and gas exporter, but he doesn't have his control over this pocket of natural gas down here in the eastern Mediterranean, the, Le the Leviathan and Tamar uh, fields of natural gas, home to some of the richest uh, resources of natural gas on the planet. And they're Israel's. And at some point, Israel's going to start exporting natural gas. To Western Europe. Turkey wants a cut of that. Turkey may get it explained to them. Nope, you're not going to do that. Vladimir doesn't like that. <clears throat> but again, the focus looking at how, how do Russian troops and friends end up in the Middle East? And then this happened last night. Uh, talking with Checkmate, we were talking about this. And I alluded to this earlier. Uh, when you When you see Russia start to send out a coordinated effort in communication. That was Checkmate's point. When you start to see that, you need to start paying attention. And this was earlier today, roughly what, two, three o'clock, 11, actually it's earlier than that, uh, in the morning. Barack Ravid, Russian foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, was expected to arrive in Israel next Monday, but postponed his trip earlier this week, Israeli officials tell me. And that's Ravid being spoke to. And here's Checkmate's commentary. <laughs> he's just more like brain droppings, hardly. Guy knows what he's talking about. This comes after a warning by the Russians to stop air activity over Syria. Checkmate was advised by an expert to take this warning seriously and that the warning wasn't a boilerplate diplomatic protest. It appears to have had some mustard on it. Further, the targets that the Israelis are hitting are designed to um, reinforcing materials going to Hezbollah's front in southern Lebanon from Tehran itself. <clears throat> and this is, he gives me a shout out, Wayne, in his defense, we'd been talking about this for a week and you know we were just going through different scenarios well, how does russia end up in the you know in the levant in the middle east on israel's door doorstep 
and and he's talked about this. If you guys have been following Checkmate, the Crimea is essentially the umbilical cord of Russia. They got to have it. It's Russia's umbilical cord to the Middle East. It's how they transport goods from Russia freely, you know, across the Black Sea, <clears throat> easily drop things down into into Syria, Jordan, uh, the the Golan, the mountains in North Israel. Got to have it. Um, you know, if the Israelis are concerned about the warnings from Russia, this is picking back up from Checkmate. It follows that this is a clear attempt to box in Israeli options regarding Iran. In that case, a punitive strike against the Mullah's nuclear program gives way to a decapitation of the snake. <coughs> Excuse me makes a northern border war with Hezbollah nearly inevitable. Well, we know what scripture says about that. It will happen unless that organization can be convinced that all of their holdings globally are at risk. Uh, and his comment about Hezbollah, checkmate that is, is an organized crime outfit with a terror problem. And to return to the heart of the argument should Lavrov show up and pound the table, which is uncharacteristic of his personal style. Checkmate should know he's had dealings with these folks and Israel agree to relent on strikes. It places Iran more squarely in the crosshairs. Lavrov is an exceptionally shrewd man. He and his boss would know what they are doing. Tehran would be well advised to watch this space closely for a soft betrayal. <clears throat> As a finer point, in all the diplomatic maneuvering over natural gas and petroleum energy going to Europe, juxtap juxtaposed over the nuclear program, they will have been left on the table. So, you know, things could get a little, little interesting. I mean, because we still, we haven't even been touching on the negotiations where they're really not negotiations. Iran sits there and stalls and says nothing. And Biden continues to give them stuff that they haven't even asked for. <clears throat> and then Tehran's response is, well, this isn't su sufficient enough. It's like, it's like the United States and Biden are doing all the giving. Uh, Iran's taking and <laughs> giving nothing back in return and demanding more. Uh, Biden's desperate to look like some sort of, peace broker. Uh, oh my. So we haven't even touched on the Iranian angle of all of this stuff. Again, just looking at Russia, how do we get Russia into the Middle East even more? And, and, and the issue is the military buildup. Scripture talks about a massive military buildup. And we are seeing a massive military buildup in, in and around Ukraine right now. And eventually, you know, speculation on my point, Take it or leave it. Uh, I suspect they'll get their way. What that looks like, how that looks like in Ukraine, I don't know the answer to that. But I suspect they will get their way, be emboldened, come south, enforce their will, impose their way. <clears throat> Something to the effect that things look better uh, <clears throat> for Russia in Syria. Finally clean that mess up a at least a little bit on paper and everybody will start calling for peace and security and it'll all be wonderful and blah, blah, blah. Then they make their move on Israel and then we know how that goes from there. And so, you know, for those who think this is a bluff, Russia's bluffing in, uh, uh, in and around Ukraine, I don't know. And Emphasis is down here. Follow my little cursor. I'm circling this little um, structure. Uh, satellite image. This is from Axios. Satellite image taken yesterday. This appears to be a field hospital in Belarus. And this was an article. I love these Axios articles. This is from uh, Jacob Knudsen. Hope I said that correctly. Satellite images show increased Russian military buildup near Ukraine. Uh, Maxar Technologies, looking at, uh, this is in central Crimea, you know, more buildup of things. Um, and I've covered this in previous posts, you know, again, they got more warships coming into the Black Sea from the Med, um, joint military exercises in Belarus with Russia, missile systems, um, 
more buildup, 68 miles from Ukraine's eastern border, field hospitals, two analysts, foreign policy research institutes, Rob Lee and CNA's Michael Kaufman have, have spotted what appeared to be field hospitals in the images. I saw some stuff from Rob Lee, although it appeared that that was from what they had done in the, in the, in the caucuses in, in and around Georgia and Azerbaijan. Uh, I didn't put those up, but other folks are reporting that as well. Uh, so you can see these, um, satellite images, true housing. I've seen pictures, you know, they're looks like a little vacation. They have these nice tents and they're nice and warm. They go in, you got people feeding them, uh, mess halls showing you know what a little what life would be like as a russian soldier now they're and i've I've also heard reports about bringing some stuff in as far as medical supplies medical personnel and massive amounts of blood and so you don't go to those kind of resources and time and effort as a bluff so something's probably getting ready to go down when that's going to be i don't know speculation is now between now into the Olympics or wait till the Olympics are over. Things seem to be changing as I present this. <clears throat> and then in this backdrop, um, you know, this is a note from Goldman Sachs published at Zero Hedge on Twitter. Crude, inventorious, crude inventories are their lowest since October 2018. <clears throat> Oil, as of this evening, had spiked at 95 bucks a barrel. And I won't be a bit surprised, you know, if we wake up one of these mornings and Russia's decided to move in on Ukraine, um, you know, we have five or six dollar gallon gas pretty quick. And Goldman makes this comment. This is a molecule crisis. We're out of everything. I don't care if it's oil, gas, coal, copper, aluminum, you name it, we're out of it. So we got shortages of just raw goods and inventories of uh, commodities. Um around the planet and now we're going to put a squeeze on oil and gas supplies we're going to fight a little war over that you can see how these things would pop in price real quick and that was the thing today too um oil gas the u.s dollar kind of separated themselves from the market went up in price stocks went down uh, I think the Russian stock market took about a 6 to 10% hit across the board today. I'd seen somewhere, you know, on threats of them invading. Um, and most of the movement in oil and gold prices, uh, especially the oil prices, took place later in the day, after hours, after the close of business. So we got a lot of things going on. And again, the focus of this tonight is, <clears throat> you know, Russia's uh, communication messaging toward Israel is becoming more consistent and you know you got different folks talking to different press outlets you got different people doing things with action toward Israel hey you need to knock it off <clears throat> and my concern's always been um you know in and around uh Syria you know when you take a look at the at the ports of Tartus and Latakia and Iran's not stupid. And when they start sending some of their um, supplies that they're trying to get to Hezbollah and Lebanon, <clears throat> they move it in next to these ports in these two places close to Russian resources. <clears throat> and my concern is one of these times, Israel may accidentally miss the mark, strike something that's Russian, blow it up, and then game on. And then they're going to move in on Israel. They're not, you know, just looking for a reason. We'll see. Uh, we know what scripture says. There'll be a lot of twists and turns in how we get there. Uh, doesn't always go the way we think it will. Keep an open mind. Don't get married to your ideas. Uh, Reach up Erdogan has taught me that in this whole mess. <clears throat> in this Ezekiel 38, 39 prophecy. But we do know this. Russia, along with Turkey, Iran, Libya, Sudan, arguably Ethiopia, and some others, they're going to make a move at some point in the future on Israel. And the question is when it's going to happen, uh, how, how it happens, the twists and turns of when we get there, 
don't know the answers to that, <clears throat> but we're seeing things being set up and things are starting to fall in line. And all these scenarios are very plausible. It's not like it's a stretch. And you look at the current geopolitical climate, shortages of fuel, energy around the planet. Uh, prices are going up. We didn't talk about the economic considerations. I need to get up with Michael DeVille, talk about some of this stuff too. <clears throat> He's got some stuff out. I haven't had a chance to review yet in and around inflation. And um, <clears throat> all the signs are there. All the pieces of the puzzle are there. It's just a matter of how they get arranged and when they get arranged. And there may be a few new pieces that I'm sure there will be new pieces we haven't even considered. So I appreciate you guys following along this evening. And uh, we'll be in touch. Stay here. We'll try to keep you up to date with some good, legitimate news information and so forth. So thanks for following. Take care. Have a great evening. Bye.